Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. All right, hey everybody, welcome to episode 358 of the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation. Check them out at performbetter.com. I'm your host, Anthony Renna. The show notes are located at continuefit.com or strengthcoachpodcast.com. All right, today on the strengthcoach.com and mbsc.tv, Coach's Corner with Mike Boyle. Spoke to Coach Boyle about finding heart rate zones. How does he find his zones? What method he uses? What he settled on from all the years doing heart rate training? We also spoke about using flying tens at a time when teams are practicing early and then training after. So it's kind of hard for the strength coach to get it in uh, during like an intense period. It comes from a strengthcoach.com forum thread. Like that just might not be the ideal time for doing speed work. So what's the solution to that? So that's coming up in a little while. Don't forget, I did a special interview with Coach Boyle called 40 Mistakes, 40 Years. You can access that interview at strengthcoachpodcast.com. For the Hit the Gym with the Strength Coach segment, brought to you by AG1 by Athletic Greens. AG1 by Athletic Greens, you get a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs. With your first purchase, I use it every day to fill in the gaps of my nutrition, like I been telling people lately i've been using it as a pre-workout as well go to athleticgreens.com slash strength coach for that offer all right today i have on dr rob bell he is a mental coach to athletes of all kinds whether that's executives or pga tour players he is also an author and we're going to talk mostly about his newest book i can't wait to be patient and we talked about mental toughness and what he means by if you can wait you can win and approaching this idea of mental toughness from the perspective of looking at time and really where he came up with this idea, where it kind of came to him. We're going to talk about the four laws of patience and the four killers to urgency, why he believes patience is the recovery of the mind, why action is not always the best answer. We always kind of love to take action, take action, take action. That might not be the best answer all the time. Where does grit fit in? Because there's a lot of things that kind of really go hand in hand with this. And understanding when to have urgency and when to be patient. So much more coming up from Dr. Rob. He's awesome. Uh, You're going to love it. You're going to love the book as well. For the Anomaly Maximizing the Member Experience with Sumi Seth, Founder of Nomly. Nomly is uh, a company that helps you build relationships through personalized communication so your members stay longer and pay longer. And he's trying to help you maximize your member experience. You go to Nomly.com, schedule a demo to get a feel for what it's all about. Use the referral code Strength Coach to get started on a free 30 day trial. Today, Sumi's going to talk about mastering the follow up. Super important. Uh, a lot of times you get people in. It's really that conversation. Once you get them on the phone, how do we follow up with them? Just some tips he learned from interactions with over 40 top gym owners, really at a bunch of different events he's been attending. So some really great tips coming up from Sumi in a little bit. The online sales going on right now perform better, 50% off a bunch of stuff, whether that's bumper plates, kettlebells, dumbbells, so much more. Check it all out at performbetter.com. Guys, don't forget... The summit dates and presenters for Orlando, Chicago, Long Beach, and Providence are all set. Actually, next episode, I have a special episode with Chris Breyer. We're going to talk all about the summits and what all the details. Now, you can take advantage of the early bird specials and hotel discounts at each location. And also, if you are having some financial trouble or maybe some scheduling trouble, like you just want to go Saturday, call Perform Better. Let them know your situation and they'll work something out with you. Their motto is that they don't turn anyone away. Their mission is to get trainers educated as best as possible. Guys, they are the best in the business at that. Don't let the cost hold you back. They'll work something out with you. Check it all out at performbetter.com. Again, if you're having a problem, give them a call. Guys, lots of things to get to you. So let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All 
All right, guys, now it's time for the shrinkcoach.com and NBSC.tv Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle. You can try shrinkcoach.com out for seven days for free. Totally new format, user-friendly, same great forum. As always, go to shrinkcoach.com for a seven-day free trial. Speaking of the forum, well, first of all, Coach, how you doing? <laughs> uh, I, I was like, we would have broke a long standing. We would have. You say, Coach, how you doing? I say, great, Anthony. How are you? And doing then great. You move on. You, you can't. You can't break that. I almost lost it. Wow. Uh, the forum, Mike, is I feel like the forum is just lately been really kind of getting. It took a little while. I think, you know, the new software, you got a lot of changes, a lot of things happening. It took a little while, but the forum's starting to kick in again. We're getting some guys back. Barry Masterman showed up. There's some, people, some people showed up who haven't been around in a long time which is really, really interesting. I keep welcoming people back who were really good contributors. So I think you're right. It's getting, I think people miss it, honestly. I think people miss the, and I, some people accuse us of being too like-minded, but I think people miss the like-minded interaction. We are a refreshingly safe spot on the internet in terms of there's no assholes. People are on there genuinely trying to help other people or trying to learn. That's all the people that are on the forum somebody who's trying to help somebody with great information, somebody who's trying to get great information. There's no jerks, no trolls. It's exactly what we always wanted it to be. And it stayed that way, which is great. I, I think initially early on, we had to, we had to boot a few people off because they were the yeah. wrong fit for us, but it's, yeah, it's going in a really good direction. Love it. Uh, coach. So I want to, I'm not going to bring up zone two specifically. I want to talk about heart rate zones though, and how you figure out yours. So how did you figure out yours? How, what, what do you usually? Yes. So I honestly, we have been playing with heart rate monitors. I would say, I mean, it was pre MBSC when we started playing with heart rate monitors, we were running with polar monitors in maybe even, I would say middle nineties. So I've had a very good, idea of what my heart rates were zones yeah because you know what my thresholds were I, I mean zones weren't as big a thing then but i knew the one thing i knew and i remember there's an old book called training lactate pulse rate or training lactate heart rate or something like that i think it was conconi i forget the name but i have the book laying around so it was a little thin book and i think the guy was either a italian cyclist or an italian um runner and that was where I got the first interval training information that I really have relied on ever since. And I just remember them talking about the idea of aerobic interval training and the idea that if you stayed above 60%, that that workout would continue to be aerobic. So we just, we kind of took that thought and ran with it. And we just went pure theoretical 220 minus your age. And and we were all pretty close, to be honest. We had a few. We started to realize then that you'd have some outliers. You'd have guys that had way higher heart rates. You'd have guys that had way. I remember Tommy Fitzgerald, who's act the Devils GM, had one of the highest. I remember him ride the bike. I watched him ride the bike in the 200s for 15 minutes. Wow. We doing five mile, but maybe actually we were doing five mile rides in. So it probably was like 12 or 13 minutes. And I would say for 10 of those minutes, he was in the 200s. And I think he capped out at like 212. And he was probably in his. I would say 20s, early 20s, middle 20s. And that was when I started thinking, wow, there's definitely a little bit of variance here. Cause, and we had this other kid, Richie Brennan, who was a great player for us at BU. And it's funny, his son, Mark, plays against his son. Now his son plays. Oh, shit. But he was a guy who was on the low end. And so we were very strict about the 220 minus your age thing. Cause at that time, we didn't know any better. We didn't realize that there was a lot of individual variance in there. And I used to harass Richie Brennan. I called him a dog. I called him all kinds of names because he'd do the workouts and his heart rate would not go up. And then with him, I remember watching him. He did the five mile ride one day and he rode a great time, whatever it was at that time. Let's say it was 12 something. So he rides a 12 something and he finishes at 184. And I remember looking at him and thinking, I'm sorry, Rich. I apologize. He said, all these times I've been yelling at you when you were in the 150s and in the 160s and telling you you were dogging it and when you're not working hard, you're not doing what you're supposed to be. You just were, you were the low outlier. Fitzy was the high outlier. And so a lot of it for us, you know, whether it was zones or max heart rate or any of that stuff, 
was really on the job learning where we started to look and think, wait a second, 220 minus your age was probably just about what they said. 30% of the people got to slot right in. I mean, to the beat, you know, you'd have guys that were 18 years old and they'd hit 202. And you'd be like, yep, it's exactly where they're supposed to be. And, but then we started to see guys in there. I remember Joe Thornton, we did a VO2 max test, same thing. Joe didn't break, didn't break 190 when he was 18. I remember that he was in the 180s when he finished, but got a really high score. So we started to, to figure that stuff out. But the 60% was still pretty easy in terms of, it was like 110 to 120. And we just kind of settled on 120 at that time. Because again, think about this. Everybody was young, right? I was young. The players were young. We didn't have, you know, we didn't have players playing in, you know, until they were 40. We didn't have coaches that were 60. We were, we were a pretty homogenous group of people at that time. We were 18 to, to maybe 30. So we had a 12 year variance built into us, but we didn't have 20 or 30 or 40 years built in. Then we started to see that our older athletes weren't going down. So it was kind of like the 220 minus your age thing, you know, Fitzy is Max heart rate wasn't decreasing as he was getting older. It was staying up there. Like mine, I rode the other day. I, I hit 184 the other day last week. And that's way above. It's 22 beats a minute or something like that, or 25 beats a minute above what my max, what my 100% should be. So I'm still working off of 120 resting. You know, 120, you know, uh, like restart. That's where we. That's where we start the next interval. So we go back to 60. So... And then you just play, okay, so that's when you know, all of a sudden people start saying, you know, zone two, zone one. Now we start looking at that. Well, my zone two, if you said sub lactate, my lactate threshold, again, I know I can get on the bike and tell you right now, my lactate threshold is probably high 150s. So if I want to ride a good five mile time, I got to stay at around 160. If I go, if I get to 161, 162, boom, I'm going to, I'm going to die at about the eight minute mark. If I stay at 157, if I stay right at that threshold number. So I think intuitively, and this is why I believe some people do really well, whether it's running or cycling or whatever they're doing, because intuitively as they start to figure out, okay, I know where my threshold is. I know where my recovery number is. I know what my max number is. And then it's fill in the blanks. Yeah. So you don't like, for example, I mean, I, I was reading an article on with concept two and they were talking about a really good. And it actually kind of went close to where, you know, uh, my max was, was, I'll go slow, 205.8 minus 0.685 times your age, right? So that was, actually came out pretty close, right? So it's not the 220 minus eight, just like from a, from an estimated, if, if you don't have somebody, especially if you're working with adults, right? Uh, I'm then, to say, I just, well, uh, what did you say? So you point, my 205.8 two, minus what? No, no. No, no, you're going to go just do, yeah, uh, 0. 0.685 okay, well. times your age. What, 0. 0.685 times your age? So that's 43 for me. No, 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 205.8. And then 205. you're going to, minus. First, the first number, yes, first number you need to get is the 0. 0.685 times age. Yeah, what? so I, but I come out almost exact 162. So I'm okay. still way above. But if you go to like Carvonin, which says, uh, takes into account your resting heart rate. And I forget the carbon in four. Uh, Mike, uh, let me, t uh, I was, I'll continue because I got okay. it. I, I think this is the carbon and it's taking heart rate reserved into account. Exactly. So it's max heart rate minus your resting heart rate. So, for example, what is your max heart rate? 184. One, my resting. One, I'm, one, about, I'm about 130. Uh, right around. I mean, my resting is between 50 and 54. My max is 184. Okay, we'll go 50. So your heart rate reserve would be 134. So now, do you take that? Did you, when you get your zones, do you say, okay, I have 184. My 60% is 184 times 0.6, which would be 110. Right. I don't, because I've never adjusted mine down. I know it's 110, but I've always used like 120 as my restart. So I've never changed it. Okay. I yeah. would, but like, but I do know, like in my zone two, I think my zone two is a little higher because I find myself when I'm trying to do zone two work, I really have to work hard to stay below 140. I have to be very focused. Yeah. Because I so, can easily. And, and, but that for me is still, I think 139 is 75% for me. Okay. Yeah, so seventy. I have I have you at one twenty nine for seventy percent. 
right? So yeah, you're right. So Mike, but listen to this though. So this one was, what you did was you, you, so now you have to take your, you take that to find your, your zones, you take the percentage of your heart rate reserve and then you add your resting heart rate. So if we did that, your 60% would be 130, your 70% would be 144. So 184 is your max, 50 is your resting heart rate, 134 is your heart rate reserve. What you do is take 6.6 times, um, 134 and then you add your resting heart rate yeah and that's i know closer i'm carvonin is closer for me okay but and i i think the biggest difference is knowing that there is a real there's a lot of opinion because it's very interesting too and i said this i actually was advertising my complete conditioning thing today because someone was talking about conditioning products on twitter i said I hate to hype my own stuff, but I think the complete conditioning is actually really good. But one of the things that we also noticed was that, and this was the Dave Tenney, remember that years ago, Dave Tenney said this, and I remember thinking it was the absolute textbook example of brilliant empiricism. Because one of the things he said with doing interval training was, he said, if your heart rate goes up more than six beats a minute from interval to interval, then your pace is too hard. I remember that. And I, when I look at mine, my heart rate, except for probably interval one to two, it might jump more than six. But after that, it will literally stay like five, six, five, six, five, six as we go up. So I finished today. I only got one in the red. I finished at 166 on my last interval. We rode 10 half miles today. But I know that I was riding at the right pace because my heart rate was incrementally creeping its way up, you know, five or six beats, five or six beats, five or six beats. And then the other thing that we realized was that if you were in the right spot, your recoveries would get longer by about 15 seconds. So in today, I literally, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post it later, but it was 48 seconds after rep one, one minute after rep two, 115, 130, 145, and then it steadied out at 145 until wow. going to the last one. And the last one was two minutes because we kind of, you know, nine, we had to kind of push nine to get the time we wanted. but. And this is why I always complain. I don't think people know nearly enough about interval training. I don't think people, and there was a great thing on Twitter the other day where they talked about track coaches doing a bad job. And if kids aren't running the pace, you know, yelling at them if they're not running the pace instead of adjusting the pace. And all you'd really need, if you're a track coach, track, whatever, you know, you're doing endurance work. If you got a heart rate monitor and you say, okay, Anthony, I want you to run, you know, we're going to run whatever, four times 440 today. And you got to run them in 60 seconds and you run the first one in 60 and you run the second one in, you know, 62, but your heart rate's gone up 20 beats a minute. You're like, pace was too hard. I got to come back next time, probably at 62. If I want them to sustain that for four, like there's, there's a real science to interval training that people don't get. And I don't think people write about it. I don't think there's enough people who do it. To know, and I've said this, it's even with, with some of the, you know, people talk about the MAS stuff and it's crazy when you look at the MAS numbers and running and, you know, whatever, six minute mile, six minute mile correlates perfectly from an MAS standpoint to like your 110 running times. If you're doing 110s, if you watch like the old football, when Bill Ferran first wrote the article, it was like 16, 18, 20, you know, skill position guys in 16 seconds, you know, like linebackers and tight ends, 18 linemen in 20. If you look at those numbers, MAS wise, they drop right in where you're supposed to be. And I think what it shows is that good coaches have intuitively found these sweet spots, whether it was, you know, bike stuff, rowing machine, football field running, 300 yard shuttles, whatever it is. And bad coaches don't, bad coaches don't get it. And whether it's, not giving enough rest, whether it's prescribing too fast a time, like you can screw it up one of two ways. Yeah. You can give someone an unrealistic time goal or you can give someone an unrealistic rest number. The heart rate monitor eliminates both of those things because it shows you if you did it wrong, it will graphically show you on the screen. Hey, look, wrong prescription. That person didn't tolerate that prescription. And if they didn't tolerate that prescription, then that's your fault. And you've got to adjust. You've got to be able to look at it and think, okay, I need to change that. 
and that's why when you think, you know, people like people run until they puke. No one should run until they puke. If they do, it was because they didn't tolerate it. It was funny. Mark threw up the other day in his lacrosse game because we had, we basically ended up playing one offensive midfield line the whole game because we were down six to nothing. And uh, they just kept sending the first midfield back out, first midfield back out. And all of a sudden, we won nine to six. We outscored them nine to nothing and won nine to six. But all of a sudden, you look over in the sidelines and he's all bent over with his helmet off. And I was like, what happened? He's like, I puked. He's like, I was dying out there. We didn't play the second midfield practice. Or, you know, they play an offensive and a defensive group. And usually you play two offensive groups to one defensive group. But when you exceed that threshold, you become, the environment becomes acidic. And what do you do? You throw up. Yeah. But, Mike, I, I, in, in every coach's defense, it's also some people just don't have the experience for that. And then you can take something like this and we look at this idea of taking a formula that's supposed to be a little bit more accurate estimate. And, you, and we know we have your 184 high max. We have your resting heart rate. Good. Now we have your heart rate reserve. But those numbers, like here's your your 60%, 60 to 70% or 130 to 144 with that formula. If I just take 60% of 184, now I'm at 110 to 129. So it's a completely different scenario here. Unfortunately, um, you know, it's a really well, hard thing. Talk about experience, right? What I always said is aim for the middle. So I wouldn't look, if I had guys that I knew were in great shape, I wasn't looking at their numbers. If I had guys that I knew were in horrible shape, I wasn't looking at their numbers. Yeah, I was looking at the numbers in the middle to really dictate what we were doing because I, I would look at it, truthfully, if it was really hard for a guy who I thought was in terrible shape and he threw up, I didn't really feel bad about that. But I don't want to look at the guy on the high end and think I'm going to base it on that guy. Yeah. So you would, you, you literally have to look if, you know, I always go back to the bell curve idea, right? If you look at the middle of that curve, you know, upside, downside, those are the people that you need to be looking at. You got to know those people on your team and look at it and think, I even, I would say that about everything, but you look at that middle guy and think if I hit that middle guy, just right, it's okay. Maybe I didn't challenge my high end guy like I needed to, but I absolutely challenged my low end guys that I wanted to. And that's really in a team setting. That's what you have to do. You've got to be able to, to, to get, I think people love, you know, bandwidth. They love the term bandwidth now, but that's really what you're trying to do is figure out, okay, how do I, what's going to encompass the largest number of guys and challenge Cause I'd even go like with that time, we didn't have a lot of heart rate monitors. I'd swap them from guy to guy and see, okay, I want to see how different guys are responding to this. And I knew everybody, like we were talking about Jay Pandolfo today who's now the BU coach, but Jay was always, the standard. If there was conditioning stuff that was going to be done, it was like, who's going to try to beat Pando today? That was always somebody's goal. But he was always going to win. You know, nobody ever beat him. That was just how he was. But as a result, I didn't pay that much attention to him from a conditioning standpoint because I knew I didn't have to. I'd stick the monitor on some guy in the middle and think, you know, if we're going to try to recover the group, I'd be like, okay, let's just say I use Chris Drury. All right. When Chris Drury hits 120, we're going again because I'm going to try to gauge that group. So I could gauge the whole group if I had one monitor and be pretty accurate. And I would know, hey, you know something, those guys are in terrible shape. They're not recovered yet. And this is going to be really hard for them. They're going to suffer. But truthfully, I wanted them to suffer. Yeah. yeah. You want to pay the price if you're out of shape. You want it to be awful. Whereas the reverse was true. If I looked at it and thought I was easy for Jay, okay. Because he'd probably beat everybody anyway. So it wasn't a big deal. I wasn't worried about it. but. But that's the whole thing with experience. And that's why I hate to say it. That's why I was talking about the complete conditioning thing, because it goes into all of that stuff. It literally talks exactly what we were talking about today. It talks about that. It shows examples of people. And it's really funny. I, I've told you this story before, and I've probably told it on the podcast, but we used to condition with the heart rate monitors on, on the ice. And our guys, it was that, at that time, you could buy the polars with the watch. So our guys would literally put their, Hurry, monitor on, put their watch on. And I used to say to people, if you were watching from the stands, you would be thinking, what the hell is going on out there? There's a bunch of guys who must have class because they keep looking at their watch, trying to figure out what <laughs> And they're all going in different directions. And they're going at different times because everybody, I gave everybody their prescription. Okay. You know, you're 130, you're 120, he's 110. That's what the rest is. 
here's the interval that we're going to do. We do like gold to blue line four times. We're going to do gold to blue line four times. You're going to rest or whatever your resting heart rate was, and then you're going to go again. So if you recovered fast, you were going again. And we could walk by and no, I'd walk right by and look and I'd be like, hey, Anthony, you're 120. Let's go. Boom, boom. Let's let's get yeah. it moving, buddy. And guys knew that. But it looked like a total cluster because guys are looking at their watches, guys are coming, guys are going, some guys are starting, some guys are finishing. And people would it looked incredibly unorganized, and it was the definition of organized chaos. Because it was the most highly specialized conditioning work we had ever done. But it absolutely looked like a total disaster to anybody who watched it and didn't know what we were doing. Yeah. Coach, if you were back with a team like that now, would you get a cart and do some, med- like some real, get the real numbers? Like, so I now instead would, of yeah. being intuitive. I, I, yep. As much as I am not an aerobic person, I would absolutely, I would like to do a VO2 test on everybody. The thing I would do if I was doing it is, I would just let guys know, I want to know the number, but we're not working on the number. The number, this is not high score wins. I Because one of the things, we, I did that one year at BU, because uh, athlete's performance was really into it. Paul Robbins, remember Paul at that time? Yeah, yeah. So we had, a, we had a metabolic testing unit, and we were testing guys on the bike and on the treadmill and getting VO2 max scores. And the interesting thing about it was I did the, the data analysis VO2 max didn't correlate to anything. And I said to Paul Robbins, I'm like, Paul, I don't understand. You know, we did 300 shuttle. We did five mile bike. We did a two mile run. Not one of those things correlated to VO2 max scores. And I, I remember this like it was yesterday. He said, Mike, you know why? He said, VO2 max is a measure of what a guy might be able to do. Wow. Said, it's not a measure of what he will do. And what we realized was that the the mental, that's why I wrote, if you can remember, I wrote a, a, a distant or an article, I think I called it physiological testing versus performance. Testing. Oh, yeah, 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 PDF. Years ago. Yeah. For that, exactly that reason. That was one of the things that I said was that physiological testing is irrelevant because we would have guys who could ride the bike for 10 minutes and blow us 68. And we'd have another guy who'd ride the bike for 15 minutes and blow a 54. And guys would be totally frustrated in terms of, I was on the bike twice as long as him, blah, blah, blah. My score is 14 points lower than his. But then we'd put those guys on the track and have them race or put them in the field and have them race. The 54 guy would consistently beat the high 60 guy. Because the high 60 guy, all it showed was he had tremendous aerobic capacity. Meaning he might be able to do really well in these events if he trained for it. (laughs) Yeah, but don't, can't the carts also give you the, act, the most accurate numbers from a zone perspective? And, and theoretically, and, yes, they can. Yeah. I mean, because they're going to be able to tell you at least uh, they'll be able to tell you thresholds and whether yeah. how you get into things like it used to be lactate threshold. Now it's not that you know they could tell you ventilatory threshold and they can tell you now probably ventilatory one and ventilatory two. All we really looked at was at that time lactate threshold, max VO two. And then the max heart rate that we got off of that. And we could, we could pull all that data off those tests. So yeah, if I was back, I'd do that once a year, just so I could have numbers and yeah. get an idea. But I also, I'll guarantee you, if you said, give me those same athletes for four weeks and I'll write the numbers down and I'd be able to stack my numbers up pretty good against those numbers, except for the actual VO2 max score, because that's way more genetically predictive than it is anything else. Interesting. Coach, I'll finish up with um, a kind of an interesting, I, I just, I thought it was nice or an interesting uh, way to do this. A uh, young man was talking about, we implemented fly in 10 starting in January and our football program at results are fantastic, but now they practice from 545 to 745 AM. And then they lift after practice four days a week. So he doesn't want to run the fly in tens, obviously after a two hour practice. So, um, then somebody had talked about doing it in, uh, he doesn't want to take the fly and tens out for like the whole eight weeks of training during the summer, but he's just worried about it. And uh, somebody had said, if you're able to conduct the warmups before practice, like you go in there, do the warmups and you do them during that period, one to two reps one day, and then another focus on max velocity. So a longer distance, whatever that was his suggestion. Well, yeah, I know you agreed with this. You said, yeah, that would be good. If you can get in that warmups, how would you, 
how would you do this in the warm up? Would you kind of tone it down a little bit? Would you keep what you're already doing the way you do it now and say, no, we're doing these in the warm ups? How would you do this? Yeah, I'd do it exactly that way. I'd put them, if I, again, if I was in charge, if it's my team, I'd be like, okay, we're going through our dynamic warm up for practice. I need X number of minutes so that everybody can get to flies. And it would literally be like, you know, you'd be buzzing because. I would be as soon as that guy gets through and somebody is by as soon as the score is written down, the next guy's going. So as fast as I can write scores, that's how fast guys are going to be running. I'd run them in pads. If they made us ideally, I'd be like, can we take shoulder pads and helmets off? But if we can't shoulder pads and helmets on, write the scores down, get that max velocity stimulus. We're struggling with that now because we're playing Mark's teams playing four games in a week for a couple of weeks. And it's really hard on the day we're lifting so we're playing Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and we're lifting Tuesday, Thursday. And it's really hard to look at a guy on Tuesday and Thursday and say, hey, I want a max velocity effort on these in-between days so that I can keep monitoring. So our guys haven't sprinted. So yesterday we sled sprinted so that we could decrease the velocity but increase the load so that we we're effectively deloading them from a velocity standpoint but loading them from a – a, a towing weight standpoint and we timed those. And then hopefully because today should be a less challenging game. Tomorrow we'll actually be able to sprint again, but we've struggled. It, it's, it's a challenge and it's particularly challenging if you don't have a really cooperative coach. Yeah. That, that's why I really like this thread. Cause I, I think it just showed that, look, there's so many different situations and we have to be flexible and, and the answers weren't just like, Hey, do it this way or, you know, don't do it. It was, there was definitely some uh, back and forth there and you got to be flexible. So coach on that note, I will let you go. Hopefully uh, Mark has a successful lacrosse week and there's no more puking involved. So uh, thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me. And I'm going to eat, I'm going to eat lunch. I'm starving. I'm taking a nap. Well, I'm doing that. After. Welcome to Nomly's Maximizing the Member Experience segment. My name is Sumit Seth, and I'm the co-founder of Nomly. In the last week, I've interacted with over 40 gym owners across many different settings. One, an intimate group of about 15 highly driven and profitable gym owners led by Pat Rigsby and Doug Sperling that meet weekly to share best practices, as well as discuss topics that everyone can then contribute towards. Two, the very first St. Louis fitness event hosted by my friend, Kevin Deneen, and three, a trio of one-on-one -on -one client interactions I personally had. All of them were on the topic of follow-up sequences designed to get prospects to book an appointment, aka the success session or discovery call. Outside of chat GPT, I have not yet seen such a high interest in one singular topic, and that too in such a short period of time. With that in mind, here are some key takeaways for you to utilize as you build out your own follow-up sequence. One, focus on getting them to take the single next logical step. Before we can get a prospect to purchase a membership, remember, we have to establish value and trust. We can do that only once we have a conversation. And before we can have a conversation, we have to get them to respond. So put your energy in getting them to respond. How do you get them to respond? That's point number two. Think about either or question techniques. These could be modeled around the kind of inquiry the prospect submitted for. For example, were you interested in learning more about fat loss or dealing with stress? Three, we could also get them to respond by letting them feel our energy, our vibe. This is easily done with a voicemail. And I say voicemail because in today's DNA, the chances that you're going to really pick up the phone, call somebody and get that person to connect with you is pretty slim. However, you still want to pick up the phone. And I'm not talking about having a robocall or a voice drop, a live human being picking up a phone and calling and then smile. You know, when you do that, the other person can feel that energy. You just know that person is smiling. And keep the tone conversational, casual, just like you would with a friend. Or better still, record a quick video and send it out to them so they can see and connect with you and your personality, the vibes that I'm talking about. Four, 
Use their preferred medium and channel for ongoing interactions. Some people might respond better to text, some to email, and still some better to phone and voice and video. Try them all. Build that all in your sequence and see which is their preferred mode of choice and then interact with them there. That's actually one of the reasons we designed Nomly to keep every form of communication in one centralized place. After all, as a coach, we need to meet people where they are in order to lead them on a journey with us. Five, remember, more isn't always better. When you say something like, I'm wide open, when would you like to meet? Subconsciously, the other person thinks, oh my God, is he really busy? Is he really good? So you want to make yourself available. Make the decision-making process easy, but don't let that sink in at a subconscious level that you are free. So try something like, would you like to meet tonight or tomorrow? Morning or evening? 7.30 or 9.30? And if you find you're not able to lock down a time, reverse the script. Ask them to share two slots that would work for them. My point being, make it convenient and easy for them to connect with you. Six, if you aren't already, track your interactions. Even pen and paper works just fine. But software like ours, designed specifically for customer relationship management, is efficient, effective, and keeps your whole team on the same page. So maybe you want to invest in one. In addition to these must-do takeaways, here are some easy-to-avoid pitfalls that can keep prospects from responding and eventually joining. One, using fake names for the connection. I was amazed when I learned that gym owners were advised to use a fake name to reach out to prospects by their marketers. This defies the absolute basics of building a trusting relationship. Being your true, authentic self is always the way to go in my books. Two, as you are designing the sequence, remember you are not talking to a group at one time. Unlike a public event, even if the sequence will be seen by a large group of people, remember the interaction will be consumed by one person at a time. So focus on building that human connection in your scripts. Three, guilt is a big no-no. It's a very poor motivator. Avoid saying things like, looks like you'd rather continue to live a life of mediocrity and that is why you haven't booked a call. No, don't be a smart aleck. Remember, the prospecting and follow-up is about building relationships. You've done this before. You already have clients. Use that experience you've gained and leverage that to guide you. Picture your ideal client avatars as you review the sequence and see if it's reflective of the experience you want your prospects to have. And in case they have started ghosting you, then use these three ninja moves. One, share your own story of why you got started to encourage an honest and personal relationship with your prospect. Two, share testimonials, social proof, so they can see themselves in your current clients and feel at home. And three, give them a gift, an ebook or a guide or some workouts that they can continue to do on their own since they did raise their hands. That way, you've done the best you can to help and also left a good, positive, warm, fuzzy feeling in the prospect's mind and maybe even compel them to take action at a later date. Do this and see your overall show rates improve, which in turn will increase your conversion rates. Oh, one more thing. As a gift for being a Strength Coach Podcast listener, if you are interested in getting a done-for-you follow-up sequence that we've designed, then just reach out to me with the subject follow-up sequence at summitatnomaly.com. That is S. U-M-I-T at Namly, N-A-A-M-L-Y dot com, and we'll send it your way. Till next time, this is Summit Seth, co-founder of Namly. For more info, please check out Namly.com.
All right, guys, now it's time for the Hit the Gym with the Strength Coach segment brought to you by AG1 by Athletic Greens. 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens. I've been using it every day. For me, it fills the gaps in my nutrition. Lately, I've really been using it as a kind of a pre-workout that I feel like it kind of gives me a little energy, gets me going. Uh, that seems to be working pretty well for me personally. But Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you got to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash shrink coach. All right, today I got on Dr. Rob Bell. He has a passion for working with athletes. And when I say athletes, we mean corporate, executive, professional, and collegiate athletes. At his office, they think everyone is an athlete. And he's been a mental coach for multiple winners on the PGA Tour, Indy 11, and at the University of Notre Dame. He's written seven books on mental toughness. And he's got a great um, sports psychology podcast, the the Mental Toughness Podcast. He The books that he's written uh, include No One Gets There Alone, Mental Toughness Training for Golf, No Fear. And now his latest book, which we're going to go over today a lot, I Can't Wait to Be Patient and the Fastest Way to Get There. Doc, thanks for doing this. Thanks, Coach. Appreciate you having me on, man. All right, I'm excited. A little extra for me because, uh, you know, we just talked about it. I've been in the golf world for so long. It's always always fun to kind of uh, talk to people who have uh, that golf background. And, I mean, look, we're looking right now. If we, if you're watching, uh, uh, if you can see any of the video, it's got a couple. It's got a master's flag up. Looks like, uh, oh, what's is that the Greenbrier? Yeah, down on the bottom. Yeah, is it's the Greenbrier. Greenbrier. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. There we go. So uh, lots of little golf mementos there. So, um, Coach, Doc, sorry. You wrote your latest book, I Can't Wait to Be Patient and the Fastest Way to Get There. You had to be patient because uh, – I did get the uh, the email a while back, and then Nicole sent me another email. I was like, uh, "Nicole, didn't you send me this?" Oh my God, sorry, Aunt. we're we're just going crazy. We're waiting. We're waiting on this, you know, to come up. And uh, so you guys had to be you had to practice what you preach on this book, huh? Yeah, right. Don't pray for patience, right? <laughs> I've never been. That's that's the ironic thing, and that's kind of why I wrote the book. There, coach was like. You know, when I talk to any dogs, and I'm talking dogs, like successful people, yeah. you know, people that listen to your podcast, um, you know, talk about mental toughness. No one's ever really come out and say, you know, I'm really not that mentally tough, like because there's so many different variables to it. You know, we can always define it, but if I ask them, "Are you patient?" right away, everyone's, "No, I'm not patient." Nobody that I know who's really successful is also really patient. There are some. You know, there are some of those personalities that are there, but it seems to be like the majority of them aren't patient and I'm not patient. And I like, I believe in like the big picture things. Like I know things are going to work out, but it seemed to be for me, like the small things in life, man, that would really just kind of work me up. Like I don't get angry often, but I'll get angry fast. You know, I'll get irritated really fast. And that was always, you know, part of the blind spots in my life that I didn't really want to look at. So it was like, well, let's just go all in, man, and and figure out this this dichotomy and duality of patience and urgency. Yeah, we're going to get into it in a minute, but I was listening to your podcast on the book as well. And I thought one of the things that was interest, interesting when you were talking about this idea about successful people are are have a bias for action. And that can tend to be the impatient part of them. Like they're just going to go right into a ready, fire, aim type of deal. And that's not always the best answer, but we're going to get into that. I want you to define mental toughness from your perspective, because I think with strength coaches, a lot of times we, we kind of think of, you know, give somebody a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? So we kind of think, let's drive them into the ground. Oh, we'll, we'll make them tough. Uh, so talk to me about your definition as a mental coach, what mental toughness is. Yeah, no, and I'm glad you brought that up because I mean, I would, I, you know, I challenge the Twitter warriors out there in terms of, because they'll just throw it out there. It's like, well, this is mental toughness. Like, no, oh, you know, it's not really mental toughness. I think you're talking about something else and, you know, they'll make it nice and sexy and for it to rhyme. Well, then it's gotta be right. So it's like, look, I, I let me define what mental toughness isn't first of all. So mental toughness 
it's not always physical toughness. It's not always about flipping big tires. The other part about, now there is a huge component about being mentally tough that goes into the physical component, no doubt, right? I mean, like, look, I do 100 mile races and there's a huge component of mental toughness when it comes to that. But the other part about mental toughness is, and I think this is important, is like mental toughness isn't going to win anybody a championship. But if you don't have it, it will lose it for you. And I look at mental toughness as well. And if we define it, I'm a jeans and t-shirt kind of guy. I know I'm wearing this, but it's the marketing for the book, man. (laughs) The definition of mental toughness is how we deal, handle, and cope with the adversity in life. That's it. How do we deal with the struggles and the setbacks? It's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. So if that is the accurate definition, how do we deal, handle, and cope? then adversity has to be present. There has to be some sort of adversity that's going to be in there. The other flip to that is how we uh, handle pressure. How do we perform well under pressure? But adversity has to be in there. And, and that's the part of it is like, in the, especially like in the weight room, like we're trying to create this, this natural adversity that's going to be there. And that part, is, and it's accurate, you know, but it's really so much about how we create that environment. And I look at, as well. And the, the more, you know, older I get, it's just like, look, I think there's just so much power in the debrief, you know, when an athlete has a setback, when they are struggling, what's the debrief look like, right? Are they able to verbalize what they're feeling? Are they able to, you know, express their emotions? Are they able to say, you know, yeah, I was focused on the outcome. I was focused on not messing up. Like it, it when, once they are able to verbalize that, then that the debrief is the workout. And then the recovery piece comes from, hey, what did we learn from that and how are we going to apply that moving forward? Interesting. Yeah. I, you, I love what you say about if you can't wait, you can't win. And uh, like you said in, uh, in kind of in the book, in the beginning of the book, is really no one's approached this idea of mental toughness from the perspective of looking at time. Mm-hmm. And first of all, I just wanted you to go over that story of kind of where this kind of came from with you, because it's kind of a great story. And, uh, and, and then we'll kind of start to look at how we can start to unpack this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it started really early on in life. I just never put the, the dots together. But it was like when I would have a really good game. And then what would happen was, you know, you get the pats on the back. It feels really good. And then nothing. And I was like, damn, well. Like, where are all the pats in the back? You know, I was addicted to the outcome. I was addicted to the pats on the back. And that became a real detriment to me when I would struggle. And then, okay, where are the pats on the back? Where are they great? It turns into expectations. So if I've always struggled with the results, I've always wanted the good times to last a little longer. Like that summer day that never ends. Like I've always, I never wanted it to end. I never want the season to end because that's the part that's so much fun. And I've always struggled with that, and I was never able to put it together. When it came together for me was training for the 100-mile race, and I had eight miles left of this 26-mile run, training run, had 16 different runs over marathon distance. And I just, honestly, Coach, I wanted to be done. And I kind of remember, like, man, I just can't wait to be done. And it dawned on me at that moment. I remember one of my pros early on, he would always say, you know, can't wait to be patient. And then I was like, well, what's, what's going on, right? Of course, I'm going to finish this run, but there has to be meaning in the suffering. And that's the part where it's like too often we want to dismiss that. And what came to me at that moment is it said, Rob, if you really want this moment of pain and suffering to be done, then you also have to wish the good times to not last as long either. And because I don't get to pick the power of time, like time is our most precious resource. It's what we all have in common. It's what it's the it's the least common denominator amongst all of us is time. But we've never approached the mental game that way. And so the proof that this too shall pass is because no matter like what kind of struggles or adversity we're going through right now, this too shall pass. The reason why we know this to be accurate is because the good times won't last either. And what I've seen so much in society today, it's it's like, man, what pisses me off so much about like sports media is whoever's going to win the championship, it's the man, the confetti hasn't even cleaned up. And they're saying, are they going to repeat? 
Like, are they going to like, where do they rank in terms of like the all time best? Mm. And it's like, wait a minute, man, they just won the championship. Can't we even just relish in this? No, we can't because it's on to the next. And they have like this way too early rankings. Well, that's just getting back to time. That's really all it is. And that's why I say in that, like, look, if you can wait, you can win. But let's just start looking at the mental game and our mental health through time, that most precious resource. And you can bring in all the hacks and all the all the mental game stuff into it, but start with the baseline. And then we're going to see, OK, well, where does our time line up? Right. And, and then we can always kind of get into that. But but that's where we have to start because it is our most precious resource. And if you ask any athlete, any coach, right, it's like, look, consistency, you show you want a consistent athlete. Well, the only way you can be consistent is through the power of time. And that's where I look in and it's more and more today, man. It's not like we want it today. It's not even a microwave society. It's just like an instant push button. We want it now. We want it yesterday. Well, no matter what, we're still going to be waiting. So why don't we get, why don't we get busy and get, and get better at, at waiting? Yeah, it's, it's uh, we're going to unpack that for sure. I, yeah, I just love this approach too, because I guess part of me uh, coming from, I do a lot of stuff with Go Ruck. And one of their sayings is, is seek pain. And I understand the seek pain part, but I don't love the saying because I feel like it's, it's very much people will read it and misinterpret it. Seek pain, really, what they mean by this, for the most part, my interpretation of it is choose the harder path when you're training. And, and you talk about it in the book, it's about the process. Like you have to keep going with whatever is going to make you better and understand it's going to make you better in the long run, not seek pain in the moment or, or kind of the Goggins esque type thing. And even Goggins, I think gets misunderstood sometimes about, uh, about what he's doing. Well, he's a little extreme. I shouldn't even really bring him up, but, but I like this kind of approach to be honest with looking at this instead of saying, we're going we're gonna to try to beat each other up over this right now to get to where we want to go because we have to do it, but there, you have to exhibit some patience. But I really want you to talk about right now is as we go into some more things, what do you mean exactly by patience for you? Can you define that a little bit more in terms of in, in the context of sports, what are you talking about? being patient because a lot of times teams or players they don't have that time and if we look at golf we could say hey they don't have any patience if they don't have their tour card they have to win that tournament so then then they have to play the next round and blah 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 so talk to me about what you mean by patience man that's really good you get me fired up just hearing you hearing you talk because I, I love <laughs> it too i love seeking out the pain i mean with with patience we're just looking at forbearance right um, the reason why patience is so difficult is because it is, it, you know, it's not, it's how we behave while waiting. That's essentially what it is, how we behave while waiting. The reason why it's so difficult is because, you know, it's harder to remove things in life than it is to add things. I mean, I think it's a whole lot harder oh, yeah. to, to do oh. intermittent fasting than it is to, you know, chug a protein drink and get a workout. You know what I mean? So that's why I look at the mental game is more about subtraction than it is addition. And so when I'm talking about patience, like, and that's where I say, like, if you can wait, then you can win. You have to be, uh, the, I say the process takes perspective. Like it, to be really engrossed in the process and only focused on the process takes a different type of perspective. It, the outcome's there. It's going to be there. And that's why we, that's why we grind. That's why we fight. But the outcome and the product takes patience. No matter what you're going to be doing in life, anything worth great in life, pleasure and pain, it's a it's a package deal. And I look at it, I mean, there's a lot of different skills that go into it, but it's like, how can we, how do we behave while waiting? One thing that I found is that emotions say hurry, wisdom says wait. Like wisdom says, take your time on this, but it's your emotions. So when we get spurned with urgency, urgency trumps the important all the time. And then if everything is urgent, coach, 
And if you're a coach and you're running around trying to do absolutely everything and everything is urgent, then what's important? And then the problem with the urgency is that there's no off switch. There's never an off switch. Now we become urgent towards that, which is unimportant. We become urgent towards everything. And then when are we having the cup of coffee, man? When are we able to breathe? When are we able to take a, a step back? When are, we, when are we able to reflect? Um, you know, when are we able to just take a 10,000 foot view of our process and how are we, you know, how, how, how's our development going towards everything? And we, we've gotten away from that. Totally agree. I think uh, it's why we're seeing more, <clears throat> more kind of courses or coaches talk about time management because yeah. it seems like with all of these these inputs coming in, whether it's a text or right, how many people out out there can will say every time you get a text for whatever reason you feel like the need to answer that text right, right away, right? Absolutely. It and email. Similar, but not as bad. Uh, but with all of these inputs coming in, it does feel like there are so many things. It's like the to-do list. With um, the, If you have a million things on your to-do list, you don't get anything done. You know, there was a study that was done that showed they had these tasks that, these tasks that were there, and they were important tasks, but they were scored exactly the same. Once they put urgency to it, Everyone got away from the important task and they did the urgent task, even though they were still scored exactly the same. Yeah. Urgency is always going to trump the important all the time. And then that becomes the issue is because we forget then what is really important. And that's what I'm talking about. Look, you've got to be a dog towards what you're doing. No question. You've got to be urgent towards this workout. I love it when Dick Vermeil said, like, there's no easing into a street fight. Like, I love that one because it's so true. Like, if you're easing into this round, if you're going to ease into this workout or this season to see how it goes, you're going to get pushed out. You have to be urgent. You just got to be urgent towards the important things. That's it, man. Be urgent towards the important, the important urgencies in life. And that's where I think we, we've missed it a lot of times. And then everything has just really become urgent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about the four laws of patience, because I want the listeners to understand, uh, uh, you know, how, because not you talked about it, successful people aren't always patient. And mm -hmm. if we feel like we're not patient, how do we get there? Maybe the four laws will help us. The four laws of patience and the four killers to urgency. Yeah, you got it, man. I mean, the, the first one's always like, it, it comes for you have to have assurance for a better future. So hope. Hope is a big part of patience. If you hope, if you know that it's going to work out, then you can be patient more with other people, with the process, with yourself. And I always look at, and one of the things I always get back to is like, it, look, it all works out in the end. If it hasn't, it's just not the end. But when we don't have hope, what happens? Well, when we're not getting the results that we want, then we make changes. Then we are urgent towards doing something. Do, don't just sit there, do something. Well, that's not always the best uh, process. And, and I, I don't want your listeners to confuse this at all, right? If, if things are going great and you are crushing it and you have a boulevard of green lights, I'm not saying stop at the green lights. Keep going, man. Foot yeah. on the gas, right? No brakes. Absolutely. But the issue is, is when adversity, when the setbacks happen, that's the time that if you just keep trying to press on the gas, it, you're going to crash because we, you know, it just doesn't work like that. Adversity is going to introduce us to ourselves that's the time that we need to, hey, let's just take a step back. Let's look at our process instead of just doing something. So, I mean, you got to have hope. Hope's going to be in there. The other one is acceptance. You have to accept where you are. You have to accept the other people as they are. They're idiosyncrasies. You have to accept yourself. Too often, I just see it's like, this is unacceptable. And I've uttered it myself. But acceptance is the key to all our problems. If you can accept a situation and where you're at, look, okay, we, we, we screwed up that half. So what? Let's move on. If we're not, if we don't have that, and that's just tying right into patience. If we're not in that, then what we're going to do is we're just going to change something for the sake of changing it. You know, that's the other one. So, I mean, uh, you got to have hope. You have to have acceptance of people. You have to have an absence. And this is a tough one, an absence of resentment. I say choose disappointment over resentment all the time. Resentment is. But it's the number one, it's the number one cause of like divorce. If you resent somebody, if you resent other people, if you resent yourself for these past mistakes, 
And that is letting go of what has messed up. And I always say, look, if you can let it go, it can let go of you. But too often we're, we bring this other stuff into our own mentality with us and it clouds our judgment. It clouds how we're doing. And that's the absence of resentment. And then the last one, and this is the one I struggle with, Coach, the ability to wait without haste or restlessness. You know, what's changed is that we still wait, but the waiting game has changed, right? So we advance order at Starbucks. But we're still waiting, like when we get there. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. yeah, maybe, maybe our drink will be there. But you know, when we get there, too often we're waiting. So what happens when we wait? We don't just sit back and hey, let's just kind of observe and see what's going on. Let's breathe. No, we go right to our phone and then we get urgent and get busy again. Busy is the illusion of control, and we like that feeling. And I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with getting stuff done. But unless it's an urgent situation, I mean, unless it's an important situation, we take we're trying we take that urgency muscle, and now we're uh, and now we're exercising it towards waiting for a cafe latte. We take that urgency muscle, and now we start to get anxious at the stop line or the stop sign. And it's like, wait a minute, the amount of time that is going to be spent waiting here in life, this makes no difference on how anything it really goes. But if we let it impact the transition, if we let it impact our mentality, now we're showing up at our destination a little bit agitated, a little bit off. Why? Because we weren't patient. You know, we got urgent. And that's what I just see that happens way too much. And we're really not even aware of it. I love the, when you were talking about being in traffic and you you always, we always blame the guy, the guy, why isn't this guy moving? Right. Yeah. Meanwhile, there's two miles of traffic and you're like, come on, buddy, let's go. Keep going. Let's, it's so true how much we kind of look at this, this little narrow, uh, we have this little, um, uh, you know, almost like a, a smaller lens that we're looking through. Meanwhile, the traffic is a mile long and I'm looking at the, the guy in front of me or the next guy. Yeah, absolutely. And I always say like, you know, the short term coach, the short term isn't incorrect, but it's incomplete. You know, it, and here's my proof on that. It's like, you know, and what we do is we just take a short term snapshot of the situation at hand and we extrapolate it into everything. So it's like you ask any young kid today who's the best player and no matter the sport, they're not picking somebody that they never saw. They're picking somebody really not even from a couple of years ago. They're picking somebody from right now. I see it all the time. It's like we're going to take a 19 year old tennis player and I'm not saying Alvarez isn't great. Like he's going to be one of the greats. But the discussion is already him being, is he going to be the greatest of all time? And I'm like, yeah, that's it. Just put the stamp on him right away. I mean, wait a minute. No, you know, because it's not incorrect, but it's incomplete. And we do that stuff all the time, coach. And it's like, wait a minute, man. Like you're, we, we, we look at the short term through a microscope. We look at the long term through a telescope. And we need to switch that. We need to be patient with how things are going to unfold and play out because we don't control that stuff. Love it. Coach, how, Doc, how is this um, correlated maybe to, to grit? I'm just thinking of the whole yeah. idea with grit and talk, talking about that there's a lot of patience involved with gritty people to kind of stay with something. How do you kind of compare the two? I, I think it's a huge part of it. You know, when I just think of like grit, we just think of, so this is how I equate it, coach. Urgency is the workout. You have to be working out. You know, I don't think too often that we overtrain. What I think we do is I think we under recover. I don't think we stretch enough. I don't think we, you know, we roll out. I don't think we're working on our balance and our functional movement. I don't think we sleep well enough. I don't think we hydrate. I don't think we have the right nutrition. Well, I don't think we overtrain. I think we under recover. And so when I look at the grit part of it, well, the grit part, the only thing we're looking at, man, is just like getting dirty and staying after it and just keep moving. Absolutely. 100%. Amen. No problem there. But what happens when we're not getting the results? What happens when we get that setback? What happens when now we've gotten failure and now what? Well, now the grit and the sexiness of that has, has you know, worn, worn off. Can we still be patient? And that's the part that I'm looking at. That's the super power that we need is patience is recovery of the mind. 
Can you expand a little bit more on that that idea of patience being the recovery of the mind? Just a yeah. little bit more. No, no, and I appreciate it. It's, I mean, think about when are the times when we're most patient. You know, the times when we're most patient, that is when the mind is at ease. That's when the mind is relaxed. That's when, and I'm not, and, and, and again, this is duality, right? It, this is not a secret, but this is the part of, boy, now that idea came to me. Let's, let's see that, right? And when that can only come when the mind is relaxed. When does the mind, when does the muscle grow? It always grows in the recovery piece. Well, when does the mind grow and when do we really get better at it? During the recovery phase. That's why I look at that patience piece of got to be patient with yourself. If we want the results, the immediate results on that stuff, it's not going to happen. And we're going to bail and we're going to switch strategies or we're going to change coaches or we're going to change teams instead of what we need to do is stay with that process and what we're doing. That's yeah. Look at patience. Yeah. And I think, I think that the, the initial piece of the four laws, the hope and acceptance piece, I like that you put those two first, because I think you need to have the hope, the belief in that plan that you made or in that decision that you made, and then yep. uh, accept some of the things that are going to change. I remember hearing about um, this idea about, you know, uh, a great day starts the night before, right? Sure. A good morning routine starts in the evening when you're writing down your big three for tomorrow. You're kind of handling everything that needed to be like tying up any loose ends from that day. So you're, you're, you're kind of, you can go home and you could not have that stuff on your mind. And then, you know, what you, when you wake up, it's not a scramble to see. So, but things change. And I remember them talking about uh, coach Walsh from San Francisco saying, we go in, we make the first 25 plays. We may, and we stick to them. We don't go now. We make some adjustments because if they're changing defense or whatever, but he said the first 25 plays, we have a plan and we want to stick to them because we've done all that work. We want to make sure we stick to it. And it does relieve a lot of stress and a lot of pressure. And it kind of talk about preparation. Mm -hmm. And when you're prepared, you feel much more patient when you're prepared. Right. Yeah. And that's where I look at. It. It's like patience as well. It's trusting the process of time. If you try bypassing time, if you try beating time, we look at time as an opponent, not an opponent, man. We just have to improve our relationship with time. Prove the relationship with time. You're going to improve the relationship with yourself. You're going to improve the relationship with everybody else. And we're just going through. That's the main takeaway, coach. Just go through the most important recess. The, I mean, the most important resource, which is time. Yeah. And, I think it does seem it, it, it it's a hard piece to 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 unpack as well with the action part because again we talked about it the most successful people have a bias for action and and we always want to take action it doesn't mean I still love the ready fire aim idea when like you said we need that we we need urgency when there's something important but it's not always the best dancer can you give us a couple of examples maybe yeah. of that coach that's why this book took me 16 months to write it's my eighth one you would think i get better at this process <laughs> the reason why it was so hard is because i kept coming back to um yeah i mean action changes everything that's what we know we know urgent we know to be doggish you know to approach this and attack that's what changes that's what wins 100 percent. where was the duality though like if there is urgent towards this, there has to be patience on the other side of it. And it was really then combining when did it mesh and when was it not the best time to don't just sit there, do something, but when was the best time to don't just do something, sit there. And that's the part of where I looked at it, coach. It was like, I mean, there became, you know, the sense of urgency that let's talk about ice and the kicker, for instance, right? Ice and the kicker. All right. We do it. They call it all the time. They're starting to change because they start to see, you know what? Icing the kicker doesn't work. Why do we still do it? Because don't just sit there, do something. Coaches want to think that they're impacting it. But you're just, I mean, at the pro level, especially, it, it makes no difference. And I say it all the time. They're calling timeout. 
it's not going to make any difference. Now, kicks do get missed, but not exponentially because somebody has called timeout. Research has even shown it. Why do we do it? Because you got to do something. Don't just do nothing. There was a study that was done, coach, on two different coaches. These were hypothetical coaches. They both lost the game zero to three. Then soccer coaches, then one coach made three substitutions. One coach did nothing. They lost the next game, the same thing, zero to three. Which coach was more favorably looked at? The one that made the substitutions, even though it was the same exact thing. Like we always defer to that. And that's where we look at it. I'm not saying action is bad at all, man. It is what's needed. But what we need to do is we need to pause, reflect, breathe, analyze it. And, you know, when adversity and the struggle and the setbacks hit, a sailboat is off course 99% of the time. In our life, you try telling, like, announce where you're going to be in five years. And if you want to hear God laugh, like, I always love that one because we don't know the path. But that's the part of if you know what that result wants to be, 100%, you've got to trust that's going to be there. But we don't know what the path is going to be. And you have to be willing to make these little adjustments, these, you know, tacking along the way. That's the part where the patience comes in, comes into play with urgency. Yeah. We talked about hockey earlier. Um, and, and when you brought up the soccer analogy or the, 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 the research study, it reminds me, and I hate this when coaches change lines, mix lines up within the game. I always hate that. I'm like, look, you have plenty of time to work on that stuff in practice and see who's who's gelling. All right, you're down to nothing. Stop trying to go with what you know. These guys have been together all season. Let them work through it. I personally, I hate when the coach starts to mix all these lines with by the by the like halfway through the second period because something's not working. I think it's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed, man. Um now in the book, you talk about uh, if you can uncover if you have a patient personality. Mm-hmm. We talked about this a little earlier. Like most successful people don't feel like they're patient. Um, how can you, if you figure out that you're not a patient person, yeah. what are those next steps? Or would we be surprised to find out that maybe we are more patient than we think? I think so. I mean, it's it's really tough, right? Because there are going to be a lot of situations that, you know, draw our triggers and get us anxious and stuff like that. It's it's fine. I mean, it's perfectly natural. Um, the, the And I admit, coach, I'm not patient. That's why I wrote the book, because I can't wait to be patient. It's not <laughs> saying, hey, look at me, look how patient I am. No, it's I can't wait to be patient. I'm totally admitting I am not patient. But here's the thing, is because we love speed so much, we are designed to get from point A to point B as fast as possible. Like we pay for time. Like wealthy people, you know, they're, what do wealthy people have? They have time. Yeah, people that have money um, or people that are rich have money, but people that are wealthy really have their time. And so this is, since we are designed to get from point A to point B as fast as possible, we romanticize speed and speed in every situation has to be great. You know, who wants to get rich in seven to nine years or do you want to get rich in a year or less? Who wants to write a book in 16 months or do you want to write a book in under 30 days? Like we love speed. So if we are not patient, if we know we're not patient, this is the challenge is favor rhythm over speed the rhythm of your day, the rhythm of how you transition from one thing to another, not getting there as fast as possible, but getting there and staying there, right? Getting there in the right mentality. You know, it's not who gets there first. It's who can get there and stay there, depending on no matter what level it's going to be, right? So focus on the rhythm, man. How's the morning routine work out? How does the unwind work out? How does that transition work out? Um, Focus on rhythm instead of speed, and then right away, now we're all we're doing is we're improving our relationship with time. Absolutely, good stuff. I want to finish up with some golf stuff, and it, only because I feel like it's going to relate to a lot of coaches who have to talk about to their players uh, in, in a situation. So, with golf, pro golfers, let's talk about pro golfers. If you got a guy now, for anybody that doesn't know, the first 
125, 125 players get their tour card for the next year. And part of the problem with that system is the guys who are above that and the ladies who are above that, they really, they have this sense of urgency. They got to do it now because then they're not going to get their tour card and then they have to wait to do the sponsorships and they have to try to make some money uh, other ways or they have to do they And then they have to play more. They have to play in every tournament. You don't see Tiger Woods. You never saw Tiger Woods playing every week because he didn't have to because he was winning big money. So he was able to recover. Right. What do you talk to? How do you talk to your golfers, your athletes about that part of it when you know there is an urgency and that is an important urgency how do you talk to them talk them off the ledge on that one and, and that's the thing it's like you have to be urgent towards your preparation you have to approach this practice like it is your last practice you have to approach this round as if it is your last round that you're going to play simple is powerful you have to approach it that way that has to be the approach but when it's not clicking, right, you still, no matter what, have to be patient with the results. Because if you start to press, now what's happened is that can turn into panic very quickly. Panic is the nasty side of urgency, right? And we see that too often. We change something. We do something. We get away from our strategy. You just have to have your game plan and be urgent um, towards the things you need to be urgent towards. And that's where I look at it. It's like, um, you know what's going to happen. I tell this in golf, and this is life. Golf and life will pay you back when it wants to pay you back. Not when you want it to, but when it wants to. That requires patience. That requires just trusting the process of time, knowing that it's going to work out. If it hasn't been this one or the next one or the one after that, and you look back at your approach, your process, how does that mentality there what part needs to change this is what i know about the best and i would even say the best let's just include those that are going to lose kind of their tour card but have been up there yep is that they always play their best when their back is against the wall when they have when they have to do this tournament this is it this is it this is all we got i have to make the cut got to finish top 10 here and they do it bam why do i know that to be true because that's why they're there if they didn't do it when it mattered the most, um, then they would be at the lower tours or they'd be out of the game. So there's a confirmation bias when it comes to that because the ones we're looking at do get it done when it matters the most. But they've all come to that point of when, hey, they got one tournament left, you got to finish the top 10, and they do it. Yeah, yeah. That's what separates them. Yeah, interesting. I try to approach a lot of my interviews with a, a – have your back against the wall a little bit. I always tell people, I try not to prepare, over prepare, because I want to make sure that I'm focused on what you're saying and not on my little teleprompter here with the questions or the thoughts. You know what I mean? Yeah. You have a teleprompter? Not a teleprompter. I have another, uh, another monitor. Oh, okay. I was going to say, <laughs> so, man, that's pretty tight. No, no, no teleprompter. Okay. Uh, that would be too much. But no, I have my notes up top on my second, uh, my second screen, but I don't have 20 questions written there. You know, you and I talked about it. You, I told you the things that I would go over. There were only five things, but I don't know if I'm going to get to them, if you're going to throw them out there first. So I need to listen to you. So I feel like the same thing. It's not just sports or it's life and anything you do and anything in your business is when you're, when, you, if your back is against the wall, you you do seem to focus a little bit more, mm -hmm. um, but I still want to prepare. I still want to have, um, I feel like I'm prepared, but not too prepared. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It makes perfect sense. All right, coach. Well, everybody, the book is, I can't wait to be patient and the fastest way to get there. Dr. Rob has some really great other books as well. He's written seven on mental toughness as well as he has a great podcast, the Mental Toughness Podcast, and you can get that on all the platforms, even Audible. So, uh, Doc, thanks for doing this. Really appreciate it. Yeah, man. And they can go to can'twaitbook.com. It's the easiest way. They can take the personality quiz. They can get infographic there on patients, but uh, can'twaitbook.com. Very cool. We'll have a link for that awesome. on thanks, uh, at Shrink Rich Pod. All right. Let's get you on my podcast too, Coach. Let's do it, man.
All right, that's going to do for episode 358 of the Strength Coach Podcast. The show notes are located at continuefit.com or strengthcoachpodcast.com. Don't forget, you can try the new strengthcoach.com for seven days for free. Like I said with Coach Boyle, that forum is really starting to get back to the way it was. Great stuff. Lots of great conversations over there. Special thanks, Chris Parry and the folks over at Perform Better. Uh, don't forget, next episode, I have a special episode just with Chris. And we're going to talk all about the summits. Right now, the online sale, 50% off. Bumper plates, kettlebells, dumbbells, so much more. Check it all out at performbetter.com. The summit dates and presenters for Orlando, Chicago, Long Beach, and Providence are all set. You can take advantage of the early bird specials and hotel discounts at each location. Guys, check it out at performbetter.com. Thanks to Coach Boyle and Dr. Rob Bell for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strength and conditioning and performance enhancement and patience. Check out the anniversary issue I did with Coach Boyle, 40 Mistakes, 40 Years. There is a link to access that at strengthcoachpodcast.com. Thanks to Sumi Seth and Namli helping build relationships through personalized communication so your members stay longer and pay longer. Go to Namli.com and use the referral code strengthcoach to get started on your free 30-day trial. Thanks to AG1 from Athletic Greens. Visit athleticgreens.com slash strengthcoach to get your free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs today. That's going to do it for this episode. My name is Anthony Rana. Thanks for listening, and I'll speak to you next time.